preparing this session. I actually don't. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. So I'm hoping I'll. Yeah. I hope to finish a few minutes early. Okay. I'll give you a warning. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, we have one more talk this morning, uh, which will go until eleven thirty, and then we'll have a tea break and then a long break until our next talk at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to welcome Swiran Kumar. He's from uh, the nearby Center for Strings, Gravitation and Cosmology at IIT. I should uh, begin making Marjorie other organizers for inviting me to be the star. It's always a pleasure to be at times. Discovery of gravitation is from particular black holes. There has been a tremendous interest in examining whether these black holes could have a primordial, primordial origin. If these black holes have to be produced in the early universe, essentially during the radiation dominated era, you need significant strengths in the primordial spectrum. The primordial spectrum has to be considerably more powerful than the spectrum on the CMB scales, on the large, on the large scales. If you want to generate spectra that are consistent with the CMB on large scales, and you want enhanced power on small scales to produce the primordial black holes, you need what are known as deviations from slow roll inflation. Slow roll inflation, as you may know, is the standard paradigm, you know, that is considered, often considered in the context of inflation. In this talk, I will outline a few models of inflation that generate significant power on small scales. And I will also discuss extent of force that are produced by produced. And interesting others will enhance power on small scales, or ACLs for that matter. The leading order in perturbation theory, the scales and tensors evolve in time, not so on the higher order. So if you enhance power, it can so happen that this enhanced scale of power can induce the gravitational waves. And I should emphasize these are gravitational waves that are produced in addition to the primary gravitational waves that are generated during inflation. Another interesting aspect that are, occurs is that if you have deviations from slow roll, I mentioned deviation from slow roll is essential to generate features, strong features in the primordial spectrum, then it also leads to larger levels of non gaussianities generated during inflation. And this can in turn impact the extent of PVHs that are produced and even the extent of gravitational waves that have been generated. So that is roughly what I intend to highlight during the course of this talk. Here is an outline of my talk. Keeping non-experts in mind, I have a bunch of slides on inflation. I will motivate, I will remind you the need for inflation. I will also talk about the standard constraints on inflation from Planck. All this should be familiar to the experts. And uh, this, this part is aimed you know, at I will talk about enhancing our small scale sites. You need an epoch of deviation from slow roll. What is often considered is an epoch of ultra slow roll, where the slow roll parameter suddenly starts decreasing exponentially, and this leads to literally a maximum increase in the scale of our spectrum. I will discuss such enhancement of power on small scales in single field models. I will also briefly discuss such enhancement of power in small scale, I'm sorry, in two field models. And then I will talk about the formation of primordial black holes. I will just quickly describe how you calculate this quantity called FPBH, which is the fraction of primordial black holes that constitute cold dark matter today. And then I will discuss about gravitational waves induced by the scalar perturbations, and we will see some scenarios can lead to gravitational waves of considerable strengths that can be detected by either the ongoing or even the forthcoming gravitational observatories. Then I will talk about the non gaussianities generated in the so-called ultra slow roll and punctuated inflation. These are the kind of models that I will consider in order to generate enhanced power on small scales. 
I will not discuss the uh, impact of these non entities. that is research that is still being carried out and we are still examining those aspects. Some of them have been examined to some extent. I will just show that the non entity generated in these, on these small scale where a significant problem is almost 100 times under the non entities that are generated I will talk about the people you can work with what I call small non-miniature states. I will describe what are these states as we proceed. Uh, I mean, when there is such and secondary metabolites can be generated from that miniature states, and I will close with a summary. So this talk is based on uh, essentially the content of this talk is based on these five papers. In this paper with my student. Uh, former student Raghavendra, who's currently a postdoc at RRI. We examine this formation of PBHS and secondary gravitational waves in, uh, uh, you know, extensively in the case of single field models. In this paper with uh, Raghavendra again, we discussed, you know, PBHS and gravitational waves from uh, squeezed initial state, non-vacuum initial states. This paper is work done with uh, Deeraj, who's faculty at uh, IMSC. Uh, where we examine uh, Deeraj and others, you know, Matthew Braglia was a student who worked on this, primarily worked on this paper, and uh, we studied, you know, generation of PBHS and gravitational waves, secondary gravitational waves in two field models of inflation. And, uh, you know, in the results, in students, I recently written uh, in my review for the galaxies and, uh, you know, many of the studies in the single field model, this is here, you wish. We need inflation. I will have about half a dozen to ten slides talk about basic of inflation and constraints on large scale state. You know this picture. This is the sorry, the same wrong thing. So you know the sky. You know the CMB sky here, and uh, you know why the CMB arises. It's a vestige of the radiation dominated era you know, which dominated the early stages of the universe. And these are the, these different colors correspond to anisotropies in the scheme B, which we know to be about one part in 10 power five. If you just have the conventional hot Big Bang model, that is a Big Bang followed by radiation domination and, you know, followed by matter domination, you can ask what is the size of a causally connected patch in the sky? And that happens to be about one degree in the sky. These wise patches represent the causally connected regions in the sky within the hot Big Bang model. But we know the temperature across the sky is you know, virtually the same to one part in 10 power phi, and this is a statement of the horizon problem. There is another way of stating the horizon problem. What has been plotted is the light cone, the vertical axis is for the time, and this is space. And so the light cones are 45 degrees in the, in, you know, because the space and metric is confirmably flat. And you can end up with this light cone, you have a light cone from the big bang, which is where the CMB arises. This is a of the plane at a retreat of 100. And this is the plan for the WMAP satellite, which is observing these anisotropies. And you see the fourth light cone from the big bang to the top of the coming. It's much, much, much smaller. In fact, about 70 times smaller than the backward light cone from today to the epoch of decoupling. How do you overcome this problem? Well, you know, eta, the conformal time coordinate, is positive in, uh, within the radiation or the matter-dominated universe. But if you can allow eta to be negative, that is, push the Big Bang down so you can have, you know, eta is negative. This can be achieved if you have an epoch of accelerated expansion, which is what inflation is. You can have the Big Bang pushed fairly down, as much down as possible, and you can have the forward light cone as big as the backward light cone and overcome the horizon problem. There is yet another way of looking at this problem. What has been plotted are two scales. One is the wavelength of the perturbations, which are always in a Friedman universe proportional to the scale factor. The other quantity, which has been plotted, is the Hubble scale, which describes the causally connected region at the time. And that's plotted in So it is dominated sufficiently early time in the universe of the two modes of starting the perturbation scale, the tensor of perturbation, running more outside the cosmic metric if you didn't have an epoch of inflation. Epoch of inflation is there, probably is roughly constant. You know that what slow roll inflation, 
and what you have is that the matter is the constant because of the fact that you have an accelerated expansion, the energy, especially in early time, can emerge from inside the Hubble radius. And what you do is that once they are well inside the Hubble radius, you are in a domain much smaller than the curvature scale associated with the background. You can impose, you know, well-motivated initial condition, what are referred to as the bunch Davies initial conditions on the perturbations, evolve them onto superhubble scales and evaluate the spectrum at the end of inflation. How do you drive inflation? As is well known, you have many scalar fields in high energy physics. You turn to one of these scalar fields. And what you have is, you know, this is roughly the behavior in something known as the Starobinsky model, which is essentially the R plus R squared model, where you have a really, you know, nearly flat region, a plateau-like region in the potential. And then you have, you know, it's in the, uh, you have a dip in the potential. And what happens is that during the initial stages, the field, which is rolling, Please note, because of the expansion, you know, uh, this ball, which is known as potential, essentially classical mechanical problem, you know, with the ball rolling down potential is, you know, uh, 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 a question of term because of the expansion. So even if the ball is moving really fast initially, it's not down and it rolls down, you know, uh, uh, it's not going to slowly for a very large, actually large effect. In question n in some period, and then here the three oscillates, and that is where reheating is supposed to happen, but we will not worry about that epoch here. So there are many, many types of potentials to drive inflation. There are single field models. Some of them, like a lambda phi 4 uh, model, is ruled out, as I will describe. There are many small field models which are consistent with, uh, uh, with observations, and you can have more complicated models involving more than one scalar field, which continue to be consistent with, uh, with uh, observations. But there is a challenge. There are many, many models of inflation. There's a list that was produced you know, almost 20 years back. And there are many, many models that are continue to be added. There has been a systematic effort you know, uh, by Jerome Martin and co to sort of constrain these inflationary models. But nevertheless, there are many, many models of inflation that continue to remain consistent with the data. In fact, some of them may not be, it may not be possible to rule out some of them. This is where the small scale observations come in handy as I will describe as we proceed. So what you do is as follows, you have a scale field that drives the inflation, the bad now. The scale field contains Perturbations, quantum fluctuations, and these are the source of radial perturbations. As I mentioned a few slides back, what you have is like these various lines that are proportional to the same matter. You have the epoch of the radius is not near. And what you do is you consider the linear perturbation theory, you get the evolution of the modes in two states. So all the Fourier modes evolve independently, and that is what these wavelengths correspond to. When you are inside the Hubble radius, sufficiently inside the Hubble radius, what you do is that the modes, the quantized field, essentially behaves like the you know, field in uh, Minkowski space-time. And therefore, you can impose well-motivated initial conditions. These are referred to as the bunch davies initial conditions. You are assuming that the fields evolve from the quantum vacuum, and they evolve onto superhubble scales where they are supposed to turn classical. And as I mentioned a few minutes back, you evaluate the spectrum roughly at the end of inflation. And in fact, you can show that the modes, the amplitude of the modes freeze as soon as they leave the Hubble radius. And in fact, you can evaluate either at Hubble exit or re-entry. Here is a typical illustration of what is known as the curvature perturbation. I plotted the real and the imaginary parts here. So in this particular mode leaves the Hubble radius around 18 e folds or so. Notice when the modes are well inside the Hubble radius, the oscillate. I mentioned that they behave very much like the Mikulski vacuum. It's the leave Hubble radius. That is, this is the time when they leave the Hubble radius. This is the, sorry, this is the time of Hubble exit. They oscillate inside the Hubble radius. They are outside there. Amplitude freeze, and you arrive at, you know, uh, you can evaluate the perception here and the, Sorry, sorry for this. Okay, either here you know, on two Hubble scales or even at late times when these poles re enter the Hubble radius. I'll we'll talk about this more re entering the Hubble radius and the formation of black holes in due course of time. I'm 
what do you do? You can calculate the spectra. In many of the slow roll models, uh, you can characterize the spectra as it is written here. These are the Fourier modes of these perturbations. There should be an MPL squared, which will appear here. This is the scalar power spectrum. This is the tensor power spectrum. These are essentially the Fourier modes that describe the scalar and tensor perturbations. I haven't written down the equations. If required, I can show them. And typically in slow roll inflation, you can describe the power spectrum in this form. Uh, you know, the scalar power spectrum in this form and the tensor power spectrum in this form. And you are also interested in something known as the tensor to scalar ratio, which is essentially the ratio of the tensor to scalar power spectrum. We are able to see tensors, so we are not worried about this quantity so much. Okay. You know, all the, you know, we are not interested in NT so much. We'll come to that if we get to see imprints of the tensor power spectrum, primordial tensor power spectrum. But we make AS very well because we know the CMB the angular power spectrum in this case. So what you are interested in measuring NS, we assume R is roughly a constant and try to find constraints on these things. So some constraints or inflation of one, you know, the CM angular power spectrum, you know, it's, it's known as the SATS with plot. You know this power on these scales are double, and this is what B is AS, and AS is what is known as a normalization. Which is of the order of eight minus and A is a particular very it's of the order of 10 power minus nine or so. And you can arrive at constraints on NS from NS and R by comparing this form of power spectra, this form of power spectra, this one, and assume R to be a constant and compare with the CMB data. And what you obtain are as follows. I'm sure you have seen this picture fairly well. And in fact, the constraints have improved if you take into account. The bicep data R is you know uh, uh, is less than 0 0.036 or so, and you have you know NS to be close to 0.965 or so. And if you ask what is the best model, you know what is the model that fits the data very well? It's what is known as the R plus R squared model of Sarabinsky, which lies here. And these uncertainty corresponds to whether you have you know the pivot so-called pivot scale leaving the Hubble radius 50 or 60 folds before the end of inflation. But you should understand that these all models that have been listed are slow roll models, which have been compared with the data. And you can ask whether, you know, the, does the CMB take deviations from slow roll? This, I'm sorry, I went in the wrong direction. And there have been many efforts to understand whether the CMB or features the Austrum image here and not exploring this extensively. And here is a set spectra that I illustrated. This is well done with my four students, Diaz and Rajiv. So you can have either a sharp draw of the color, please keep an eye on the spectrum here. It's later that it is this kind of spectra that leads to enhanced formation of primordial black holes, provided we shift the location and the height of the spectra. And there are oscillations in the spectra. There is a certain burst of oscillations. These can be generated with different kinds of potentials that have been illustrated. Again, you can consider one such potential here. This is a phi squared phi cubed phi four potential, which contains a point of inflection, and that leads to an epoch of ultra slow roll inflation. And they can generate here, you know, I'm sorry, they can generate, you know, notice there is a power here and there is an enhanced power here. This is the Kobe normalized amplitude. Here, we have considered a suppression to you know, fit the data at the low multipoles better. You know, for instance, the quarter pole has lower power. So what happens is that if you have lower power on very large scales compared to the Hubble scale today, they can slightly improve the fit to the data. All I'm saying is that even before that, this, you know, this case of the primordial back the effort to understand whether you can have sharp features in the primordial power spectrum. So how do enhance problems on small scales? I should make a remark in this regard here. So you have here, consider this. This is an M-squared by squared potential, but there's a small step that has been introduced. If there is no step, it would have, have cylindrical relation, and you will have a very scalar million of spectra. So if it's a step, what happens is the slow roll, there are deviations, deviations from slow, and that introduces a burst of oscillations, as you may be able to see, in this you know, green uh, curve here. If you have continuous oscillations in a potential, this leads to continuous oscillations in the power spectrum. These are still consistent with the data, I should mention. If you have a point of inflection here, you can have very sharp behavior in the slow roll parameters and the power spectrum. And in fact, 
we will use potentials of this type to enhance power on small scales. So how do you enhance power on small scales? And why do you want to enhance power on small scales? The point is as follows. Earlier, I had plotted the evolution of the physical lengths. You had a physical wavelength here and the Hubble parameter here, or the Hubble radius to be precise. What I have been plotted, what I have plotted here are the co-moving length scales. And there are a variety of scenarios here. You don't need to worry about that. This is the behavior of the Hubble parameter in the equation. It comes not sharply. The does not change with time. So it's fixed. These are all different scales. And you can have reading, you can have an epoch of radiation domination, you can have non trivial scenarios. All these are being considered here to examine the effect of primordial black hole formation as well as you know, effects on secondary and even primary gravitational waves. So you can have various epochs, but if for simplicity, you can you know, ignore reheating, you can draw a line here which corresponds to radiation domination. So what happens? You have a certain amount of power on small scales, and they re-enter the Hubble radius at a later epoch during radiation domination. You should recognize that the scale that re-enters the Hubble radius at the time of equality is 100 megaparsec. So in other words, k of 10 power minus 2 megaparsec inverse. All other scales re-enter the Hubble radius during earlier times, during the radiation-dominated era. Okay. In other words, wave, wave numbers with k greater than 10 power minus 2 megaparsec re-enter the Hubble radius during the radiation-dominated era, and that is what we are interested in. Okay, so we are interested in wave numbers which re-enter during the radiation dominated era. So here is the radiation dominated era, here is matter domination, and then you have you know, an accelerated epoch corresponding to lambda. So what happens? This is again a cartoon version of the previous picture. I've cut down you know, further details. So you have an epoch of inflation, and you have epoch of radiation domination. You know, the horizon, or the Hubble radius comes down sharply, exponentially in fact, and then it increases during the radiation dominated epoch. The wavelength of the co-moving perturbations remain the same. You have the CMB scales on large scales. You want to ensure that they are consistent. The power at these scales, at these CMB scales are consistent with the CMB data. What you do is that you fool around with the physics that occurs during the late stages of inflation, Therefore, you enhance the power on small scales. So you enhance the power on small scales here. And they are supposed to, when they re-enter the Hubble radius, and what you have in mind is that there is a certain mass that enters the Hubble radius, and you assume that entire mass collapses to form primordial black holes. That's the picture that one has in mind. As I mentioned here, I've talked, you know, the zeta is the dimensionless amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. You want it to be about 10, between 10 power 4 and 10 power minus, 10 power minus 4 and 10 power minus 5 on these large scales or very small k, k of about 10 power minus 4 to roughly about 1 megaparsec inverse. You know, you want at these levels, this is the Kobe normalized amplitude that I was talking about. If you want to have significant number of primordial black holes produced, I have to emphasize that even if the power remains at this scale, at all scales, okay, and I want you to, you know, there will be primordial black holes produced, but they will be significantly suppressed in terms of their number. So if you want to produce a significant number of primordial black holes, such that all of them constitute the dark matter today, then you need to have powers on small scales literally close to one, very close to where the you know, cosmological perturbation theory remains valid. So you need a mechanism, you need an inflationary model or other models where you have power on this scales and suddenly it has to rise and it has to be of this amplitude. And what you can show is that if you have an epoch of inflation which ends then this power, once it rises, because of the termin of termination of inflation, will come down. In single field models, as I will describe, you know, uh, I will not have time to provide a proof, but I will show what happens. What happens is that you can tweak your spectrum, I'm sorry, your potential, such that it's quite consistent with the CMB data, 
you know, as the field rolls down the potential at the early stages, it generates power spectra, which is consistent with the CMB data. And then suddenly something happens to the field. It starts rolling very slowly, and that will lead to an enhancement of power. And one can show in single field models, the growth in power can be of the order of K power four and not larger. In two field models, you can make it even sharper. And because of the end of inflation, what you will see is that suddenly the spectrum will become very red. So you will have a peak in the power spectrum, you know, a rise and a fall in the power spectrum leading to a peak in the power spectrum. So here are some models which allow an epoch of uh, ultra slow roll inflation. So you have various potentials here. I've described two of them. I will describe a couple of other potentials. The important point about these single field models is that all of them contain a point of inflection. And this point of inflection, you know, this is the phase space behavior of the scalar field. And this vertical line here indicates the point of inflection. This is, of course, the field, and this is, in some sense, the velocity of the field. What happens? It starts high in the potential. It's real slowly. If you don't have any features in the potential, everything is smooth, what will happen is that it will eventually, you know, if you look at a simple M squared, phi squared model or a lambda phi four model or your Starobinsky model, it'll just roll down. This line will be very flat and it'll come and fall in, in the, at the middle of the potential. Remember, it comes down, it oscillates around the minima and that's what will happen. But because of the point of inflection, what happens is that strangely, first, the field speeds up. It's in the negative direction because the field is, you know, um, phi n is negative. It, 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 the velocity is negative because the field is rolling down the potential. It speeds up and then suddenly, as it approaches the point of inflection, remember the point of inflection is where the V phi is zero and V double phi is also zero. The first and the second derivatives of the potential are zero. So essentially the force on the potential is very small. There is already a friction term that is happening. And as a result, I'll just come to you in a minute, Sanjeev. Okay, so it slows down and the velocity almost comes to a halt. And, you know, in certain potentials, it'll just remain there. But in certain cases, it can emerge leading to, you know, it will fall at the bottom of the potential leading to an end of inflation. Sanjeet, I can answer your question. Uh, probably you so the thing is that earlier i thought that the point of inflection is necessary to suppress power at the lower uh, oh i can move it around and do it wherever i want okay, okay. Need, because so, you need power at the smaller scale for the PH, I, will, right? I will just illustrate with the help of the power spectrum okay. i can do it um, on large scales huh. or small scales it is just a matter of moving the point of inflection okay okay Okay, but without the point of inflection, also you could get. See, so there are there are other uh, there are other possibilities. You know, Swagat talks about a small dip or a bump in the potential. Yeah. There are you know two field models offer a much richer variety, as I will show. There are many varieties of potentials, but most pop many of them do admit an epoch of ultra slow roll, as I will describe. Okay, meaning the green one you showed, you know, in the, your previous one of the plots, like That's green right. and blue. So there also when you had this. So uh, this guy. Yeah. This is the kind of power spectrum we will see. But remember, these are from 10 power minus 5 to 1 megaparsec inverse. But we will talk about much larger scales as I will see. So what we'll have is that there will be, this will be Kobe normalized. I will push this up. This power will go up. It will go up and come down. Oh, okay. So, so All right. put, a, put a bump at around 10 to the minus 2 or something like that. No, no, much smaller scales, not at 10 power minus 2. That will be inconsistent with the CMB data. Okay, so that 100 mega per sec you want to fix, okay, beyond. So this, I'll push it here, as it, will, as it will be clear in a few slides later. Yeah, okay. So what happens is as follows, you know, so I hope this phase space picture is clear. So the field slowly rolls. It rolls incredibly slowly, ultra slowly, okay. And then somehow it emerges from this point of inflection, which is, you know, has a wife-like grip, it emerges to end inflation. And that is reflected in the behavior of the slow roll parameter, which reflects the speed of the field. It's very small at 10 power minus three. In typical slow roll inflation, what will happen is that it'll remain at 10 power minus three and will go and then ro rise to one ending inflation. But in an ultra slow roll epoch, as you can see here, you can consider various models. You, what you find is that it starts exponentially coming down 
you know, rapidly coming down, in fact, not exponentially in a power law manner. And then what happens is that during this epoch, the slow roll parameter, first slow roll parameter indeed remains small, but the rapid change of the first slow roll parameter leads to large values of the second and the higher order slow roll parameters leading to a deviation from inflation. I'm sorry, deviation from slow roll inflation. And this is under the set of potentials. These are known as punctuated inflation models. The only difference between this set of models and the earlier set of models is that, you know, there is a brief period where inflation is actually interrupted for about less than a fold. But there is, after the interruption, there is an epoch of ultra slow roll, as you can see. And in certain models, it is difficult to terminate inflation, but you can construct many, many potentials, which, you know, where there is an epoch of ultra slow roll, and then the first slow roll parameter rises, leading to an end of inflation. As I will describe, there are some challenges in considering these models. Um, what you need to make sure is that this slow roll evolution is consistent with the CMB data. What it means is that it needs to lead to an NS, which is close to 0.96 or so, and it needs to lead to a tensor to scalar ratio, which is less than 0 0.036. There can be challenges in some of these models may not be consistent with the CMB data. It can be as far away as three or five sigma. So if you want to overcome you know, these challenges, you can reconstruct an inflationary potential such that it is consistent with the CMB data and also generate enhanced power on small scales. I haven't still shown the power spectrum. I will display the power spectrum in these models very soon. What you have, you know, let us just focus on this. What we have done is that instead of specifying a potential, we have specified the behavior of the first slow roll parameter. We have taken one typical example of a slow roll behavior in one of these models. And we have chosen to construct an epsilon one of n, which is indicated in blue. This is from a given inflationary model. This is something we have by hand constructed. Once I specify an epsilon one of n, I can construct the corresponding potential in terms of the background equations. So with these set of parameters, notice there are many parameters which describe this epsilon one of n. Because I have so many parameters, it is possible to construct a reconstructed scenario that is consistent with the CMB data and also lead to enhanced power on small scales. If you ask me, can I construct a V of phi analytically corresponding to this epsilon one with these various parameters, there lies a challenge, but you can construct a numerical potential that is consistent with the data in single field models. I had promised to show the power spectra. These are the power spectra in various scenarios. This is in, you know, what is referred to as an ultra slow roll inflation and punctuated inflation. You don't need to make these distinctions actually. What you need to consider, you need to remember is that there is an epoch, I'm sorry, there is an inflection point in the potential which leads to an epoch of ultra slow roll. And this epoch of ultra slow roll leads to a sharp rise in the power spectrum. And one can show, I mentioned this, you know, that this growth in power is of the, is behaves like K power four. And I also mentioned because of the termination of inflation, this power comes down. So there is a growth in power. You try to ensure, you know, what has been plotted is the scalar power in, you know, in red and the tensor power in, uh, in blue. You need to make sure that this is Kobe normalized and the NS is 0.96. Many of these models, in fact, do not satisfy those constraints very well. And of course, you need to ensure that the tensor to scalar ratio is less than 0.036 or so. But what happens is that when there is a deviation from slow roll inflation, when there is an epoch of ultra slow roll, there's a sharp dip and there is a rise. I mentioned this rise goes as, you know, K power four. And then because of the end of inflation, you have a fall in the power spectrum. This is essentially because the epsilon one parameter rises again to end inflation. And in the reconstructed scenarios, you can consider situations where there is, you know, this is one of these examples, say an ultra slow roll model or a punctuated inflation models. You can construct reconstructed scenarios where there is number one peak occurs at different scales very easily. And you can also ensure, you can also try to ensure that the peak in the power spectrum is fairly wide. It is fairly challenging. In fact, you require fine tune inflationary potentials to achieve the power and enhancement and power at the required stage. It is much more easier to enhance power in two field models. All you need to do is that you need to induce a turn in field space. 
But even when you induce a turn in field space with a canonical scalar field, there is notice in this particular case, I have two fields, phi and chi, and the phi and chi are not interacting. I'm considering potentials which are separable. So you have a potential describing phi and a potential describing chi. If you had set f to one, you can induce a turn in field space by coupling the phi and chi, but you will not be able to in, you know, generate sharp you know, rise in power at any point in your power spectrum. If you want to achieve that, this is a discovery by essentially uh, Matteo and Dheeraj. What they found was that you can construct, you, know, you can consider non-canonical scalar fields. You can consider f of phi to be of this form. And this phi and chi interact through this term f. And what it does is that it induces a turn in field space and it introduces something called the tachyonic instability. What it does in contrast to the single field case where you have only curvature perturbation, there is a curvature as well as an isocurvature perturbation. The isocurvature perturbation feeds the curvature perturbation, leads to a rise in power, you know, in modes that leave the Hubble radius after the turn in field space. This is the behavior of the fields in this model. So notice there are two fields which are evolving, phi and chi. This is the chi field and this is the phi field. The phi field comes down, oscillates at the bottom of the potential. During this initial stages, the chi field hardly evolves. It reminds where it is. But at this point, you know, at this point, what happens is that the chi starts evolving. So if you plot this behavior in a field space, the chi, the field is evolving initially along the phi direction. And then suddenly there is a turn along the chi direction because phi is not changing, chi is changing. And this change, what it does is that notice suddenly the epsilon one parameter, which is which was rising, sharply falls very much like the ultra slow roll scenario in the case of single field models. And then it rises again close to one to the end of inflation. And what it does is that it produces power spectra of this form. You can make the field turn at different locations and you can lead to enhanced power at different scales in the power spectrum. And what Dheeraj and Matthew has done is that they have tried to ensure that there are peaks in the power spectrum, as you shall see, corresponding to various gravity wave observatories. We will see that, as I mentioned, this will generate secondary gravitational waves, and they have located these peaks so that they are sensitive to the various gravity wave observatories. Before we turn to discussing um, uh, discussing the impact on you know uh, the generation of secondary gravity waves, let us understand the implication of formation of primordial black holes. So remember, we talked about the formation of primordial black holes. I had a cartoon picture. You had these modes, very small scale modes. I'm talking about scales, which are much smaller than one megaparsec inverse. In fact, we will talk about scales much smaller than, in fact, 10 power four megaparsec inverse for reasons that will become clear as we proceed with our discussion. So you're talking about these small scales. They re-enter the Hubble radius. If they have significant power, as I described in the previous slides, you can you know, imagine that they will collapse to form primordial black holes. So here is a, okay, no. Here is a quick outline of the calculation of this quantity called FPBH, which describes the ratio of the energy density of primordial black holes, the energy density of cold dark matter. So what are we interested in? You have a primordial power spectrum. You need to calculate the corresponding spectrum of density perturbations in Fourier space. And that's given by this expression. During the radiation dominated era, you can relate the primordial power spectrum to the spectrum of density perturbation. Delta is the density contrast, delta rho by rho, namely the, you know, uh, the dimensionless ratio uh, in, uh, of the perturbation in the energy density in say dark matter. So you can construct the sigma squared, which is the, you know, Variance in the spatial density fluctuations, you smooth over a certain scale R, and that's, you know, that is achieved through a window function, which for simplicity we will assume to be of this form. So you take this primordial power spectrum that I have displayed, which is calculated at the end of inflation, stick it in here and calculate this P delta of K, plug this in here and calculate sigma squared R. And R has been introduced by hand through this window function. And once you have that, you need to relate R to K. 
what you are assuming, as I already mentioned, is that you have all the mass, let us say MH is the mass inside the horizon or the Hubble radius when a mode re-enters the Hubble radius. You assume all of that mass collapses to form black holes and you introduce an efficiency parameter. The mass of the black hole is some gamma star, which is typically assumed to be about 0.2 or so of the mass inside the Hubble radius. And now you need to relate somehow R to M. I'm sorry, R to K. You assume in the absence of any other scale in the problem, K to be R inverse. And one can show with these, uh, with these assumption that R, that is the scale of interest or K inverse, is related to the mass of the primordial black hole through this relation. What I want you to understand is that if you are talking about a solar mass black hole, so this is one, so you need a peak in the power spectrum, which lies at about 10 power 14 megaparsec inverse or so. A solar mass black hole corresponds to a scale of about 10 power 14 megaparsec or a wave number of 10 power, I'm sorry, 10 power minus 14 megaparsec or a wave number of 10 power 14 megaparsec inverse. In addition, you're assuming that the density contrast is described by a Gaussian distribution. You take that guy and plug it in. This is the number of black holes that form. There is to be a certain critical delta, delta C, you know, you assume, and beyond which they collapse to form black holes. And uh, using that probability distribution that I displayed in the earlier slide, you can calculate the number of black holes formed when the modes re-enter the Hubble radius. You can evolve that to calculate the number of primordial black holes, or rather FPBH, which as I mentioned, is the dimensionless density of black, dimensionless fraction of primordial black holes that contribute to cold dark matter today. And that is essentially given by this expression. And what I want you to appreciate is that you calculate you are given a PS of K from inflation. You calculate this quantity. So essentially, it is this quantity that determines beta of M or equivalently FPBH. And this is where this, prob this enters the probability density. And you have, this is where all the information lies. And what I want you to appreciate is that this expression, this number of primordial black holes, you know, which depends on beta M, is exponentially sensitive to delta of C, delta sub C. And it can, you know, as I will display, by changing delta sub C to 0.32 or 0.4, you can reduce FPBH considerably or enhance FPBH considerably. Now we need to talk about constraints on the FPBH. Black holes evaporate, as you know, due to Hawking radiation. The temperature of Hawking radiation is given by this expression. It is inversely proportional to the mass. So black holes with lower mass evaporate faster than black holes with larger mass. And you can calculate the time scale of evaporation by dividing the mass or the energy of the black hole divided by the luminosity associated with this temperature, and you obtain a time scale of this, uh, of this magnitude. So a solar mass black hole you know, will take about 10 power 63 years to evaporate. And you can ask what are the black holes, you know, if they had formed in the early universe would have evaporated by now, you will find that with black holes with mass 10 power minus 18 times the solar mass, you're talking about, you know, about 10 power 12 kg or so, any black holes with mass less than this would have evaporated by now. And what are the constraints on this quantity FPBH? These are the constraints from black hole evaporation. Beyond this, you know, all the black holes would have evaporated, but if many are evaporating, they will leave signals either in, they will produce everything possible. You have to appreciate evaporating black holes will produce everything possible, okay, in pairs. And there are constraints on, for instance, E plus, E minus, where from Voyager, constraints on the extragalactic gamma radiation. And those all, you know, lead to the constraint, you know, displayed here. And if you have small, blast, small mass black holes, you can have, you know, um, uh, you can have gravitational lensing, and the gravitational lensing constraints are illustrated here. Now, if you have primordial black holes forming in the early universe, if you have binary black holes, they can merge and emit gravitational waves, okay? And from the observations of the rates 
of mergers of binaries by the Ligo Virgo Consortium. You can ask what should be the corresponding constraints on the number of such primordial black holes, and that is displayed here. And there can be other constraints if there are you know, masses accreting onto black holes at a redshift of about 300 or 600, you know, and they can ionize the CMB and they can in turn lead to such constraints. I'm not able to comment about all the constraints here. In fact, there'll be much more constraints that will be displayed in the next few slides, but you have strong constraint on a wide range of mass spectrum apart this region, which is actually roughly the size of the asteroids. So this is the FTBH for different models that I had considered. This is for an ultra slow roll model, or this is a punctuated inflationary model. I said with the reconstructed scenarios, I can easily shift the locations of the peak in the power spectrum. I can shift these peaks using reconstructed scenarios in single field models. It's much more easier to shift the peaks in two field models. Okay, this is the model that I, you know, examined with Deeraj, Matteo, and others. So you can, you know, lead to these peaks at different locations. And what has been plotted here are different curves corresponding to different values of delta C. I had mentioned that it is extremely sensitive. FPBH is extremely sensitive to delta C. And even if, as you change from something like 0.3 to 0.45, the number of black holes, you know, the FPBH can fall from roughly one to about 10 power minus seven or so. And what should be the value of delta C that should be used is something, you know, that is still debated in the literature. So you can also understand this. We use the reconstructed scenario to construct different, you know, peaks with different, at different locations and different widths. And we calculated the corresponding FPBH. This is work done with Raghavendra recently. And what we find is that the FPBH indeed goes as m power minus half, as you could have seen here. FPBH goes as m power minus half. What it essentially implies is as follows. Once the peak hits, you know, it contributes to FPBH. The width of the peak does not play a significant role in you know, spreading this uh, FPBH curve because you know, of this exponential sensitivity to delta C. I mentioned that when you have enhanced power on small scales, it will also induce secondary gravitational waves. That is what we will turn to now. You can show at the linear order in perturbation theory, the scalars, vectors, and, and tensors evolve independently. In other words, when I examine scalar perturbations, I don't need to worry about the tensor perturbations and vice versa. But at higher order in perturbation theory, as you can imagine, you know, scalars can induce tensors and vice versa. You can consider second order tensor perturbations. And you can ask whether they can be induced by quadratic perturbations of the quadratic scalar perturbations of the linear order. The psi are the perturbations in the, you know, uh, in the metric, the so-called body in potential. This is roughly like the curvature perturbation whose spectrum we are interested in when we talk about the scalar power spectrum. So I want you to appreciate these are quadratic in the scalar perturbations. These are quadratic in the linear order scalar perturbations. And they can act as a source of the tensor perturbation, second order tensor perturbation. And these are secondary gravitational waves. I had earlier, you know, talked about constraints on the tensor to scalar ratio generated during inflation. And those constraints correspond to primary scalar perturbations. I'm sorry, primary tensor perturbations. In addition to primary tensor perturbations, which can act as a source for the stochastic gravitational background that Sanjeev will talk about later in the day, we can also, you know, these secondary, I'm sorry, these secondary gravitational waves can also act as a source for the gravitational, stochastic gravitational background. So what do you need to do? You can, you know, you can solve this equation and calculate the spectrum of perturbations. So what do you need, what you need to do is you are interested in the generation of these perturbations when the modes have entered the Hubble radius. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll cut out some part. Yes. When these have re-entered the Hubble radius, and so you transfer the curvature perturbations to later times during the radiation-dominated epoch using a transfer function, and you can estimate 
the strength, the dimensionless density of gravitational waves today. And you can express in this manner, you can evaluate you know, toward the late stages of the gradation dominated era, and you can calculate what is omega GW today. That is the dimensionless energy density of gravitational waves today, secondary gravitational waves. And these are the quantities, you know, that arise in various scenarios. The bottom line is that, you know, these are the sensitivities of the various observatories. Here is the PTA and the SKA that you may be interested in. You can have scenarios essentially where this omega GW is comparable to the strengths of the gravitational waves, secondary gravitational waves that have been generated. And this is the situation in the two field models. I mentioned earlier that Deeraj and Matteo had chosen these scales so that they are sensitive to different, uh, you know, different uh, gravity wave observatories. So this can be detected by SKA or PTA, this by LISA, BBO, DeSigo, and so on. So you can shift the peaks in the primordial power spectrum. You can construct potentials so that there are different peaks, you know, and you can ensure that, you know, they are correspond to the sensitivities of the different gravity wave observatories. So I understand that I have just five minutes, so I will talk about um, non gauss entities and I will skip um, uh, generation of features from squeezed initial states. So what has been plotted is the bispectrum. Instead of the power spectrum, you are interested in the bispectrum, which consists of three wave numbers, I'm sorry, wave vectors, but these three wave vectors form at the edge of a triangle, and therefore it's actually the bispectrum, though it contains three wave numbers. And typically what you do is that, you know, you, um, you produce bispectra of different shapes. So this is K3 by K1, this is K2 by K1, you plot density plots of the amplitude of the bispectrum, and bispectrum can have very non-trivial shapes. And often what is done is that one considers something known as that equilateral bispectrum because it peaks when K1 equal to K2 equal to K3, something local because it's completely independent of K, and something which lies in between supposed to be orthogonal, but I should clarify that bispectrum can come in a variety of shapes. And this is, for instance, the bispectrum generated in slow roll inflation in a typical M squared, phi squared model. This is work again done with Dirac, okay? So what we have plotted is this density plot of the bispectrum in a slow roll inflationary model. What you find again is it peaks in the equilateral part of the bispectrum. You can compare such bispectra with the CMB data and ask what are the constraints. What you find is that these are the constraints and what is known as the non gauss entity parameter describing the local bispectrum, equilateral bispectrum, and orthogonal bispectrum. And the bottom line is that, you know, single field models, slow load, slowly rolling single field models involving canonical scalar field, which are favored by the data, are also consistent with the data at the level of the bispectrum. But this is all on large scales, the CMB scale. There are no such constraints on small scales. We are going to, this is, this lack of constraints on the small scales is what we exploited to enhance power on small scales, which in turn led to significant amount of PBH formation and generation of secondary gravity waves. You can ask, what is the structure of the bispectrum? Bispectrum, as you can see, has more structure than the power spectrum. You can consider for simplicity, the equilateral limit when all the k's are of the same length. And what you find is that it has a shape very similar to the power spectrum. And you can calculate what are the non gauss entity parameters. I had mentioned at the beginning of the talk that the non gauss entity parameters are very small in slow roll inflation. They are of the order of 10 power minus one, or I'm sorry, 10 power minus two, or even smaller. But what you find, you know, I will not, I don't have time to explain this plot. You can calculate the non gauss entities when there are deviations from slow roll using codes that we have developed with Deeraj and later my uh, uh, recent student, Raghavendra. You can calculate the extent of FNL generated. What you find is that it can be of order one and even larger over certain scales. So these non gauss entities are going to play a significant role both in the extent of PVH produced and the extent of secondary gravitational waves generated. So they provide additional constraints on small scales on the primordial spectrum, primordial correlations, and therefore on the power spectrum. I don't have time to talk about this, so I'll skip this, and I'll just go and conclude with a summary. I have shown that inflationary models permitting an epoch of ultra slow roll lead to enhanced power on small scale, resulting in a significant production of primordial black holes and increased strengths of secondary gravitational waves. 
I should mention that even in slow roll inflation, there will be primordial black holes produced and secondary gravitational waves produced, but they will be of significantly small numbers and strengths compared to the scenarios I have discussed here. The single field models require a significant amount of fine tuning. In fact, many of the models that have been considered will not be consistent with the CMB data on large scales. You can use the reconstructed scenarios, but you don't like them. You have to turn to two field models because of the additional dynamics involving the second scalar field. You can easily constrain, I'm sorry, you can construct models that generate the you know, required features in the primordial spectrum. I talked about the effects of non gauss entities in single field models. There are efforts to examine the uh, uh, non gauss entities in secondary, I'm sorry, in, sec in two field models. And there are also efforts to understand the implications for you know, formation of primordial black holes. There are some results out there in the literature and you know, implications for the generation of secondary gravitational waves. One hopes that with these additional constraints on small scales, you know, in, you know, in addition to the primary constraints on the CMB scales, you know, one can use this wide lever arm to constrain the inflationary potential. With those remarks, I'll stop here. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that interesting talk. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Let's go with, are there any questions from students first? Any students have a question first? No. Okay. Let's start over here and we'll. Oh. <laughs> um, Thanks, very nice talk. Um, so indulge me for a second and assume that half the dark matter is your primordial black holes and the other half is my favorite model of particle dark matter. Um, would it be correct to say that whatever causes um, the small scale enhancement in power uh, through through uh, ultra slow rolled inflation or, or anything else would inevitably also enhance the small scale of the matter power spectrum, the dark matter power spectrum, and that I would end up with th that substructure in dark matter is inevitable if, if I have particle dark matter as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that is what has led to the primordial black holes. Yes, okay, I think, so So you're so, saying it is inevitable that yeah, you will, absolutely. if you have, okay. So once you have that, you know, P of K, you can plot it on top of, you can evolve it and calculate the matter power spectrum and that'll be a bump. Okay. And that is what has led to the structures. Okay. Okay, very okay. good. Okay, yeah. okay, that's interesting. That's exactly led to this formation okay. of primordial so, black holes. Okay, yeah. so dark matter need not be smooth if if it's a two component uh, thing. Exactly. Okay, that's it great. It could be component. Okay. Thanks. I, I'm sorry, it could be uh, clubbed. Clubbed, okay. Yeah, that's what it is. I have two questions, but I'll ask one, go back, then Sanjit can ask. So, so recently, the ACT collaboration came out with the result NS is equal to 1, which is in tension with the Planck value of 0.96. And so let's say if it is confirmed and stays at 1, is it still consistent with your scenario? With, yeah, with I, could, I would remodel? imagine that um, you have, a, if it is NS is 1, you need a very, very, very flat potential. Uh, I didn't know about this result. Uh, to my knowledge, yeah, Dheeraj, do you want to comment about it? He says there is a constraint which says ACT indicates NS is consistent with what? Okay, so the ACT result is uh, based only on the small scales. ACT cannot see below L equal to 500. So uh, if you take only Planck, probably Planck will also give you a consistent to one. So the NS equal to... 0.96 comes by the joint. When you say small scales, you are talking about 10 power minus 2, 10 power minus exactly. 1, 1. A multiple yeah. moment of uh, 500, 500, let's say, more, more yeah. than that. Uh, if you take uh, large intermediate scales, let's say equal to 2 to two, uh, 2 to 500, and also go up to a city, uh, 3000 or something like that, uh, you will never get uh, NS uh, so, close to 1. In other words, if you add the Planck data, I doubt NS becomes 1. Yeah. That's what my feeling is. If it's if, if there is a window in power spectrum where NS is close to one, you know, I mean, my feeling is that if you add Planck data, it should come down to one. All right, uh, then it come down to I'm point sorry, nine come six. down to point nine, nine six. six. Apologies. Yeah, that's my feeling. 
but you know it, it is a completely different ball game if ACT alone points to some NS equal to one over over a certain range of scales, then there is more room for DREG to fool around with different kinds of models which produce features. But you can construct an inflationary model that is consistent if that is indeed the case. Sorry. Yeah, the 92 model, but uh, I mean, it uh, basically, if you change the base potential, you can also generate that feature in with a uh, NS of 0.96. So, yeah. Ah. Uh, so, my question is that, see, with uh, since you can generate the peaks at any scales and so on, Effectively, you are creating another tool to put constraints on the CMB, uh, on the primordial potential, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. like the NSR plot people produce, is there a way, like you can do another single parameter thing to, you know, that would be nice, right? I mean, you, you so, have... No, it's more complicated, right? There are, uh, th firstly, these are upper bounds, right? So, uh, upper bounds are the power spectrum. So, there are efforts, to, you know, I haven't shown that plot, Okay, there are many, many efforts where you will um, you can use some form to constrain what is the upper, you know, um, or rather what is the lower bound on the power spectrum. Sorry, am I saying that correct? Upper bound, I'm sorry, on the power spectrum. That is, it is Kobe normalized. Unfortunately, I have a blackboard. I don't know whether I can draw there. So you will have. So you, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So these are the CMB scales, and there will be some, you know, there will be constraints from new distortions, etc. And there will be constraints. It, the power spectrum has to be below this. Uh, no, I, okay. I was saying. So it cannot be described in terms of a single or a small set of parameters. There are too many. But but you could still constrain the second derivative of the potential, right? Because if it goes like if it becomes like there is a point of inflection, then you get a power so suppression. You have so to recognize that here you have observations here you have upper bounds or you know you have to understand that so in other words fpbh you are told that it is below a certain value that corresponds to a certain upper bound on the power spectrum it has to lie below that so there is still all this power spectra are consistent uh, right right so no so i am saying sorry i'm just okay. going i'm saying suppose you had a potential which had a point of inflection then you would get a bump somewhere, meaning a deep or a bump somewhere. So, in some sense, you could constrain the maximum or the minimum of the second derivative that your potential could permit, right? And that is a single so one parameter. It, it thing. depends on where you want your feature, right? It depends on where you want the feature. Uh, okay? That's right. Yeah. If uh, it depends on where. So, what I'm trying to say is that you can have a power spectrum which behaves like this, which behaves like that, and consistent with the data. Okay, so we can introduce a point of inflection to generate this, another point of inflection to generate oh, this. That okay. people, uh... So there are, so it is, I mean, you have to recognize Sanjeev, you know, what you are talking about is very ambitious. That's 20 years down the road. Okay, but the, what it is important is that we have recognized that there are, you know, initially there was there used to be this criticism that, you know, you can constrain only the initial eight, 10 stage e folds of inflation. Not quite so. Now you have, you know, I haven't talked about many other possibilities. non gas entities can help constrain, you know, uh, well, what is the implications, okay? There are loop corrections people are talking about as we go, you know, even theoretical arguments, whether excess power on small scales can cascade into, you know, when you take into account higher order corrections, to cascade into CMB scales and, you know, whether that in turn, pure theoretical arguments can constrain the extent to which you can enhance the power is being discussed as we speak. Okay. So those days are still far away, but the, the important lesson is that there is a wide window now, a wide lever arm to constrain the inflationary potential. And there are many other possibilities. You know, you have to recognize that, you know, you can generate magnetic fields or SU2 gauge fields during inflation. That will have an impact on uh, impact on secondary gravitational waves. Okay. Or something I haven't talked about, you know, you can speak to Ria Jul here, okay, who has examined the effects due to reheating. Okay. You know, you can have reheating scenarios, multiple reheating scenarios where your gravitational waves will stick, primary gravitational waves stick, you know, and they can be comparable to, 
the sensitivities of the uh, some of the ongoing and forthcoming gravity wave observatories. So there are many possibilities. The interesting point is that you can use small scale observations to constrain the physics of the early universe. I'm not even talking about inflation now. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay. One more question up here. Let's take one more and then we'll sure. break for tea. Sure. I think he was just stretching. <laughs> So maybe something you didn't mention in your talk, maybe a more general question outside the slide team of talk. So, I mean, his colleague, Jerome Martin, has you know, written a 400-page review paper on all models of inflation. Yet, I mean, so one model which is not mentioned there is Einstein, a model of inflation from Einstein Cartan gravity. I think Maurizio Gasparini first wrote about it in way back in 1986. So, so what are your thoughts on that? model and uh, in general, whether that's the consistent with data and whether that leads to primordial black holes. So I do not know about this specific model. But just models for inflation from the because other then... models that Jerome, Vincent and Christophe have examined all talk about only slow roll inflation. Oh. Okay, so they know they are only slow roll inflation. Okay, so they will not produce significant number of primordial black holes. Okay. Or at least, you know, you need to change the parameters that they have considered there can be some potentials, you know, you, where if you change the parameters, when they mean by a model, it's a potential and a range of parameters. It is possible you can take some of those models, change the parameters and generate excess power on small scales. But to my knowledge, they have considered only slow roll inflation, uh, you know. But in general, I mean, scales. independent of this review paper or uh, what are thoughts on major in inflation from Einstein, Cartan, gravity? From I am not able to comment okay. about this. I'm not aware of that sure. work. Okay. Okay, great. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. So we have tea now, and the discussion session that was scheduled from 12 to 1 is being posted.